Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about five things WordPress users need to know about copyright. So how many of you were in my presentation yesterday? A couple. Okay, so we are going to dig a bit deeper on copyright today, which I know some of you were really hoping we would do. So um, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, and I'll mention again today, um, I feel like it's missing it. Nope, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, there's my Twitter handle. I actually created a page on my website for you all. Uh, those that were at my talk yesterday, I had a bit.ly link that was quite hard for people to kind of write down. So I created a page on the website that actually links to the handouts for both yesterday's talk and today's. And I've also put up a couple of bonuses on there. There were people yesterday asking me about GDPR. I actually put a link to the handout that I did uh, for an iThemes webinar uh, with Nathan Ingram on GDPR. Um, and there's another bonus that I'll mention later today that I put up for you guys. So um, that's my website. That's where you're going to find the information. Um, I gave it the, as you can tell, I'm in the process of moving a website from AnnaBlanche.net to AnnaBlancheRave.com, which is why the link is the way it is. I've only been married five years. Probably should have done it before <laughs> now. Um, but that's where we're at. Today we're going to talk about five things. Oh, and there's actually only four up there, but believe me, there is probably more than five. Um, we're going to start with what is copyright, how long it lasts, all that kind of thing. We're going to then talk about the difference between copyrights and trademarks very briefly, but people seem to get quite confused um, about that. Third, we're going to talk about some myths. Uh, I did throw in there uh, in our section about whether or not you're protected, which is the fifth one. Um, I actually threw an extra slide in about stock photography, partly to address the discussion that was happening yesterday. So I wanted to make sure we talked about that. And then we will talk about fair use. Uh, I know there's some nonprofits in the room, and I really wanted to kind of discuss that and make sure we covered it for those that have questions about fair use. Okay, so this is important. Today's session is not legal advice. It's general information only. Um, in part because, well, you know, us being here does not mean that I'm your attorney. I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I'm not your attorney. Um, the other thing that's kind of important to note is I'm not currently licensed to practice in the United States. So let's be like clear about that. Um, I work a lot with law firms. The reason I'm not practicing in the US has nothing to do with ethics. It's because I found myself living in New Mexico um, because my husband is active duty in the Air Force. And moving around with the Air Force sometimes can make it a little harder, harder to continue to practice law. So that's one of the reasons I'm a communications consultant. And I work predominantly with law firms. So I have a really huge network of attorneys. Um, and I can often connect people with someone who's the right person for them to speak to. But I'm certainly not here today looking for legal clients. That's not why I'm here. Um, so there we go. So we are going to talk about copyright, as I said. So what is copyright? This is pretty much the definition that the Act has. It protects original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, art and artistic works. Uh, including poetry, novels, movies, songs, computer software, and architecture. What is not up there? It doesn't say anything about websites. But that doesn't mean that websites, uh, their content, their images, and everything else isn't covered. So that's kind of an important note. Sometimes the law uh, includes things and moves along a little behind technology. So there's that. But I doubt even if they ever uh, change this definition, it would ever specifically mention websites, okay? So we are going to talk about, a lot of what we're going to talk about today we'll be talking about in terms of kind of the pieces of it, so the text or the content and the images and software and how they relate. So they are all covered under copyright. So how long does copyright last? So it depends on several factors. It's also going to depend on, uh, you know, companies themselves, which are legal entities, legal persons, can also own copyright. So that can impact this somewhat. But for works created by an individual, protection lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. Um, that's going to be particularly helpful for those of you who uh, like quotes uh, of people uh, long past. I actually love quotes. I'm an um, English major from way back. I have a master's in, in English as well, and I'm working on a PhD in English. So I love this kind of thing. But for works created anonymously, Pseudonym, pseudonymously, gosh, I can't say that this morning. That just means under another name other than your own. And for hire, protection lasts 95 years for the, from the date of publication or 120 years from the date of creation, whichever is shorter. Um, why that's important is because you'll see 
I don't know if you guys have been on uh, platforms like Etsy lately, but you'll actually see people in there selling uh, images of patents that might have been filed. Um, there is a specific rules around um, what the government can or cannot own. Um, we won't really get in that, into that today, but some of that actually does come into play when it comes to what you can sell that's in the public domain. Getty Images has found themselves in trouble because they've taken images from the public domain and then tried to sell them on to people as well. Uh, and we'll have some examples of that. Um, the next thing I just want to kind of point out <laughs> is that copyright is not the same as a trademark or a patent. It's different. People like to say, is that copyrighted? I mean, I'm not going to criticize people's language. I think it, it's part of who we are in our culture. But in a sense, copyright refers to uh, the rights you have over something. So um, once, as soon as something is created, there is copyright. So as soon as the shutter is pressed on a camera, there is copyright that vests in that image. Uh, as soon as you write um, a sentence, there is uh, copyright vesting in that sentence. Um, you don't necessarily need to put a C with a circle around it for something to be, to have uh, copyright protection. Uh, and that's quite important. Now that can help dissuade other people from copying it. So I'm not necessarily going to tell you not to put those on your websites. But in and of itself, you don't need to have one to have copyright protection. All right. A little bit more definitions on the trademark and copyright first. So a trademark is a word, phrase, symbol and or design that identifies and distinguishes the source of goods of one party from those of another. So, just yell out some trademarks that you know of. Coca-Cola, Nike, yep. Um, you can distinguish those goods and services from one another. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why at the moment, we'll talk about this, uh, talk about something later, I'm gonna mention hashtags and how they relate to copyright later. Um, but a service mark is another, it's often, often comes under the same definition as trademark. So people will often use trademark to also describe service mark. But I want to make sure you understand the difference between a trademark and a service mark. So it's a word, phrase, symbol, and or design that identifies and distinguishes the source of a service rather than goods. So I'm going to suggest that for many of us in the room, if we're going to trademark something, really what we're going to be doing is seeking a service mark for our, for our businesses um, and or the services we're offering. Now, if you actually offer a, um, a source of goods, then you're going to be looking at a trademark. Now, these definitions are included in the handout. All right. Um, as I said, trademarks often used in a general sense to cover both of those. And then when you add copyright into it, that whole area of law is called intellectual property. So when you go to search for an attorney to help you with this, this kind of thing, you're going to be looking not for a copyright lawyer, you're going to be looking for an intellectual property attorney, an IP attorney. And that'll give you a little bit more of the language to be able to find the person you need. All right, let's talk about myths. Okay. A copyright notice is needed to ensure legal protection. I actually already gave you this one already. You don't actually need a copyright notice to have legal protection. Um, it's just a nice deterrent sometimes because that was actually the law prior to the mid-70s. So that's important to note that there's still people out there who think you need it in order to have that copyright protection. That copyright only refers to written material. It's a myth that you know, if there's any photographers in the room, I know there are some photographers here, drive them batty. Uh, that people seem to think they can kind of just, an image doesn't matter. Whoops, we went backwards and stuff forwards. Okay. Copyright myth number three. As long as you credit someone, you can use the images. No. That's probably the area that most website owners, builders, bloggers get themselves into trouble with, that area. Uh, especially on Instagram. Four, if you use client-provided images, you cannot be liable. That's a myth. Even if the client's the one who's providing you all the content, you can, as the website builder developer, can potentially be liable. Yeah. Yeah. Number five, I can use images I find on Google. What I will 
will say to this is possibly if you find out that that image is covered by or you can obtain a license for that image. And we can talk about the different kinds of license. But in general terms, please educate your clients as well. Not cool. Um, and that actually goes for everyone. That goes for non-profits, for profits, I don't care. You can't just pull images you find online. Okay, if it's available on Unsplash Pexels and Death to Stock Photography, then I'm cleared hot to use them. Not necessarily. Cleared hot's a, sorry, that's an Air Force term. My husband's invaded my brain. Um, cleared hot, cleared hot basically is what they say to the pilots so they can take off. So it's what you can do to continue. Now the answer to this is not necessarily, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. I myself love those, I personally would lo sometimes love to use Pexels and Unsplash and everything myself. But here's the thing I found, have found in the last six months. Things have changed. I don't believe that Pexels and Unsplash are actually doing a lot of due diligence to make sure that whoever's uploading those images actually owns the copyright to them. So be careful. I've had situations where I've like double clicked on the, the photographer that it kind of gives credit to even if it's a commercial, uh, co Creative Commons commercial no attribution license. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, I clicked on the guy and I realized very quickly he had not taken the photo. He did not own the copyright to that image he had put up there that supposedly was covered by a license. Now we'll talk about whether or not you could rely on that license legally a little bit later. But I'm going to say to you, please do your due diligence. Like, I love those sites like the next person. But I'll talk to you about how sometimes free is not free in the long run. Uh, and I want you to think about that. I also want you to think about the ethics of it too. So, the final myth we're going to talk about is that copyright infringement isn't a big deal and doesn't cost much money if we're busted. I know it seems like that. I mean, the internet's a big place. How many of you have gotten a nice or not so nice email from someone saying, hey, you use my image? Only one person? Does that mean that none of you in this room, or all of you in this room, can tell me 100% that you are certain that you have never committed copyright infringement on any of your websites? So you can all tell me 100% you have never committed copyright on your infringement on your websites. Well, we can talk about that because I think, how many of you use memes on your social media? Uh, sure. Yep. It may or may not be enough. Yeah, but that may or may not be enough. If that person isn't the copyright owner, you could, s exactly, that's what I'm saying. You need to be 100% sure you know. And if you don't know through those sites, don't use them, is what I'm saying. I mean, I know that's hard. Like, that's hard to hear, but we'll talk about how much this can cost you. And I, I'm here to kind of help you for it to not cost you that amount. Yes. Is there a website where we can, like, So you're going to need to go to a stock photography website where you're paying for the license. I mean, like you could try Tin Eye and see if that helps you. Tin Eye, so as in an eye, so tin and eye, um, as one way. But I mean, this is something that people need to think about. T I N. All right, so these are the exclusive rights of the copyright owner under Section 106, Title 17 of the US Code. Um, I'm not going to read through this, but I wanted you to see that. This is what the law says. This is actually straight out of the section. Um, what this means is that you taking an image and putting it, like downloading it, saving it onto your hard drive, and then putting it up on your website actually refers to reproducing the work. Because when you save a copy, you're create when you save a copy to your hard drive, you're creating a copy. If you prepare derivative works, so I know many of you, and I look, I've done the same thing with images I found on Pexels and Unsplash because it is, they s market it as a Creative Commons commercial no attribution license, which should mean you can create derivative works from that. Now, derivative works is anything where you change it. So if I crop it, if I add, Im like, add text on top of it, any of that, that's creating a derivative work. Okay, so you have to make sure you have the appropriate license for that. 
even if you have a commercial, commercial license for an image, that doesn't mean you have a license to create a derivative work. Okay? All right. Let's talk about commercial versus personal, because I know some of you are like, look, I'm only doing this on a personal blog. Yeah, maybe? There's a few of you. I'm going to say to you that commercial is a pretty broad definition. So commercial use may be commonly defined as that which is intended for commercial, promotional, endorsement, advertising, or merchandising purposes. Now, if you truly have a personal blog where you're only doing things that maybe your family is reading, you have no advertising at all on the blog. You're not trying to sell anything. You have no affiliate links. You uh, are not a brand ambassador for anything. Then maybe it could be argued that that's a personal, uh, personal use. But, I mean, this stuff is incredibly limited. So I'll give you some examples of commercial. Branded company websites, brochures, adverts, a meme shared on a business Facebook page that you don't own the copyright for and you did not create a business presentation or product packaging. This also goes for nonprofits, because in this context, a nonprofit is a tax status. Okay, not commercial or, or personal. Next, personal or non-commercial use may be commonly defined as that which is not for commercial gain. But remember everything I just said, because really that's going to be limited to what I've got up there. Very, very simple. You're printing a copy for your personal reference, or it's like a, a, a Christmas letter for the family. You know, something that will, ne like, will never have a commercial use, like never have a commercial meaning. I guess unless you're someone super famous that is going to sell their Christmas. I don't know. I mean, who does that? All right. So, it's another little military phrase because I was in the army myself. B-L-U-F, bottom line up front, images must be licensed. You need the appropriate license, whether for personal use or for commercial use. Because very often those Creative Commons licenses I was mentioning will, will tell you if it's for personal or commercial. These types of licenses include the commercial, okay, this is whether it's Creative Commons or not. So if you speak to a photographer who's doing your family photos and you want to use that family photo on your business website, they are more likely to give you a personal license because that's their standard as a family photographer to give you a personal use license. You're going to have to ask them, hey, can I get a commercial license for this so that I can put it on my business website? If you don't do that, you are committing copyright infringement because if you use something that you have a personal license for in a commercial manner, it is copyright infringement. Even though you paid for the services to have the photo taken. Yes, but you have only paid for their services. You do not own the copyright to that image unless you buy the copyright to that image. Okay, so you have commercial derivative, which is what I was talking about, where you can take an image and you know, do things to it. And you have commercial attribution, which is where you can use it for commercial uses, but you must credit the photographer and you must say where the image came from, you know, that that's the photographer and, or the copyright owner. And then the final version, which I don't have up here, which is commercial non-attribution, which is what Unsplash and Pexels use, which sounds great in principle but I, I'm increasingly got some concerns about it. So let's talk about fair use. Who has heard of the term fair use? About half the room. Okay. So fair use is an exception to copyright infringement. It's a defense, actually. So even if you are covered under the fair use exception or exemption, that doesn't actually mean you haven't committed copyright infringement. There's just a kind of a complete defense to it. Um, but it's more complicated than that. So fair use is any copying of copyrighted materials done for a limited and transformative purpose. I'm not going to get into too much detail on that. But examples include that you've used the material to comment upon, criticize, or parody a copyrighted work. Most commonly, you're going to see this when people create those parody songs. So they're usually going to be covered by that fair, fair use exemption, um, as long as it is very clearly a parody. Um, those kinds of uses can actually do be done without the permission of a copyright holder. P one of the most famous uh, users of this in the movie world, this music world, is probably Weird Al Yankovic, right? Yeah, see now you know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so how do you determine fa fair use? Legally there's a four-factor test. Now if this is something that you're super interested in learning more about, please send me an email um, because this in and of itself could be an entire talk. Um, is it personal or commercial? 
What's the nature of the copyrighted work? How much of it is being used? Okay, um, and what's the effect on, of use on the potential market or the value of the copyrighted material? Um, so, for example, you can't just take a textbook and copy all of it and give it to, your, to give it to every single one of your students. Even though you're in an educational environment, which you'll see there, is part of the, part of the classroom use exception. There are still limits. So for those of you who, I actually was thinking, and I need to think a little bit more about whether or not word camps would be included in this fair use exception. Haven't necessarily seen anything that I'm particularly worried about here. Um, but we are in a classroom, or a classroom-like setting. Uh, we're here in person. Now the question is, would WordCamp be considered a non-profit educational institution? And the argument can be made, well... WordCamp is not non-profit anymore. There you go. So the answer is no. WordCamp is not covered by this fair use exemption. So that also goes, honestly, for most non-profits, and it actually goes for many uh, educational environments. So if you're teaching a class, a community class, that doesn't necessarily mean you're covered by the fair use exemption. If you're teaching a class for a university, then you're good to go, as long as the university is a non-profit educational institution. Okay, so we're gonna move on. I wanted to cover that though. Okay, but this copyright thing isn't really that big a deal, right? I mean, so many of you have told me like, no one's ever sent you this letter, this doesn't really matter, does it? All right, so I said that copyright is vested as soon as something is created. That means it doesn't have to be registered with the government. But for non-registered works, that is works that receive common law copyright protections, like we've been discussing, um, that can cost you actual damages and what they call disgorgement of profits. And what that really means is if you've made a profit in any way, shape or form out of what you have uh, you know, copyright you have used that belongs to someone else, then you will be ordered to pay that money to someone else. Now, they cons the court considers this pretty broadly. So, for example, I, I talked about a meme on a, on a business Facebook page. They may actually look at how long did you have that image up for and what were your profits for your company for a particular period of time? How many clients do you normally get from that resource? And then they do a, a, you know, a formula. They figure it out. So this can cost you a lot of money. Often, that's why I say if someone does send you a letter and they send you a bill for the use of the image that you maybe even unknowingly used, it may be cheaper to pay that than to go to court. Next is registered work. So what I mean by that are images, generally speaking images, although also written work, that has been registered with the Copyright Office, the US government. Uh, that can be done for a small fee. Um, someone mentioned to me yesterday they have a situation where they have a client who hasn't paid them but has received some images from a shoot and they've told the client, look, you can't use those images until I'm paid. And the client says, well, watch me. And, and my general advice is I'd go read, the cost of registering those images could pay off very nicely for you. Because if you <laughs> register those images, it could actually be anywhere from $750 to $30,000 per use to the person who's used that image, all the way through to $150,000 in a statutory penalty, so that's automatic, if it's willful infringement. Now in that case, they've had a conversation, she said, you cannot use this until you pay me, they use it anyway, it's pretty willful. Yeah. Okay, this is why I, I know people still want to say to me, oh, but it isn't a big deal. This is why I'm here talking about it. Because I, I don't want this to happen to you. What do you mean by registered? Uh, uh, registered with the Copyright Office. So they don't have to be registered, but if you're a photographer or you're a videographer, I'm going to tell you that registration with the Copyright Office should be part of your cost of doing business. Because genuinely, down the line, if things happen, if you have a client who maybe hands on images to someone else, they get published in a magazine, then this becomes a, like very much worth the cost of the registration because it's minimal compared to this. This is also where an attorney is more likely to take your case, okay? Because if it's the first one, it may not be worth it for them to take the case and it may not be worth it for you to bring the case. But in the second case, if you have a very image heavy presence, it's not a bad idea. Yes? 
Yeah, they do it as a bulk. Um, there's certain things that the Copyright Office will do where you can, uh, it's cheaper if you register more images at the same time. So you can, I, I'm not 100% sure because I'm, not, I'm not doing it all the time, but I do work, um, one of my main clients is actually an attorney who works with photographers. So I spend a lot of time writing about these issues. Uh, no, you would have to register every single page each time you change it. I just think it might be, yeah, not cost effective. So the question was, can you register a website itself? Um, okay, are you protected? So here's some things to think about. Um, because I'm not going to leave you with all the doom and gloom. I'm going to give you some ways to move forward with this. So make sure you have a contract and the contract clearly details copyright ownership. So anytime you sign a contract with a client, uh, if you are a uh, website owner and you're working with brands, make sure you're very clear on who owns the copyright to the material that you're producing. Uh, if you're a content producer, same thing goes. Is it work for hire or is it something where you retain the copyright and you're giving them a commercial license to use it? Depending on the jurisdiction indicated in the contract, get local counsel. Uh, each contract will tell you what venue or jurisdiction the contract applies to. Read your contracts. I mean, even my favorite clients who I love uh, dearly, I still read all the contracts because every now and then a, a mistake gets made. Uh, maybe the rate's wrong. Like we've discussed run rate and the rate in the contract's not the same. Read your contracts. Be careful of the use of images of identifiable persons without a specific model release. I love that people have been taking photos of speakers at this conference. And on one level, I don't know that anyone here would come after you. But if you've taken a photo of an identifiable person at this conference and you put it up on your website and you don't get permission from them to do that, then legally speaking, you're infringing on their publicity rights. Okay? Now, it can be as simple as this. Send them an email. Hey, I took this photo of you. Here's a copy of the photo. Um, because, you know, they maybe want to know that they don't look terrible in the image. Because if the image presents them in an unflattering light, then you can, you can find yourself in, in trouble. If you're using the image in a, on a, commercial, in a commercial entity, so on your website uh, or on your Facebook page, then in one sense, uh, you're using them for publicity and advertising, and you need a model release for that. So it can be as simple as send them an email, send them a picture, and say, hey, do you mind if I put this image up in my post about Word? Word Camp Birmingham. Do you mind if I include that on my website? If they write back and say, yep, sure, no problem. Guess what? That's permission. And you can keep a copy of that. Say that again. Oh. <laughs> OK. There is an exception to this, and, and I'm fine with that. I mean, it's contemporaneous, whatever. Um, thanks for letting me know. I appreciate that. Um, there's a couple of things that you need to know about this. This is not considered a public environment. Yes. <laughs> oh gosh, guys, I am like so not, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to like, I'm really not the wet blanket. I want to spend more time with you so you know that. <laughs> I don't know if the 15 year old would like to live in my house, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, but just be aware of that. So, um, Somebody was telling me about they run events and we were talking about maybe some ways around that. So very often when you buy a ticket to an event, it will be included on the ticket that there's a model release. So just be aware of that too. So if you're going to go after someone, make sure that you're on solid ground as well. Yes? So what is, I have a Facebook business and when I've been out at public events, like at festivals and stuff, I have people who like to take pictures and what is the thing that I do have is they sign with my advertising. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So to really cover yourself, I would say just, you know, have a clipboard with that statement at the top and have them sign it with their name. And then you probably you would need to check with your local attorney, like an attorney in your state. But that could be a potential solution to that where you just don't have any issue. Having it as a publicly available sign, probably good, although someone could argue I didn't read it or I was... Now, for you, particularly if you're dealing with children, you're going to make sure that a parent or guardian is signing that on their behalf. Yeah. 
Excellent. Yeah, I would just make sure you have something they can sign and you're good. And you could just do it as a sheet yeah. where like you could do 20 names on the sheet. Yeah. yeah. Could you talk about public areas? Yeah, so public areas technically, well, for public areas, you can take photos of people without their permission. You can. However, be very careful with children and publishing photos of children. And be very careful if that person is, you can see their faces. So what I say to people is if you want to take a crowd shot, I think, like you're at a parade and you want to kind of get the crowd in, take photos of the backs of their heads. Because you still kind of get the atmosphere, but you're not necessarily going to run into that visible people issue. If you do take a photo of a person and then you're going to publish it, um, really it is best, you can. There's some really great, like, good ways, there's some good, uh, workflow management system, so I use, for example, Dubsado, you can create a form on there where on the fly you have an iPad, someone can, you know, sign to give their, their model release, if, especially if it's an event like that where you've taken a photo of a visible person. Um, so just be aware of some of these things. It can kind of become part of your workflow so it's not, so there's a little less friction in this. All right, defend your copyright. Please, for all of us, actually, defend your copyright. Because in order to have these rights, if you don't defend your copyright, then you can be held to have abandoned it. And so, say if one person takes your image and you don't do anything about it, and then they hand it off to someone else who hands it off to someone else and it ends up on a billboard. That's happened. Uh, it happens a lot. It actually happens a lot in the um, sports and athletic industry. So my husband, I mentioned this story yesterday, my husband is an ultra marathon runner. Crazy, absolutely crazy. He's also six foot three. Um, <laughs> probably two to three times a month, he has pictures of his stolen from his Instagram account that appear on fitness magazine Instagram feeds. Now, I haven't, actually, I haven't yet sent any of them invoices, but I regularly do DCMA takedown notices for him on two grounds. One, he is the photographer, usually. He'll do them as selfies in the middle of his training sessions, right? He'll stick it up on a tree, take, you know, run past it, take the camera off or do a selfie while he's in the middle of a... Uh, training session. But two, it's also the publicity rights. He's visibly, it's him in the photo. So there's two grounds upon which he'll take that down. Be careful with Instagram, Facebook. If somebody has infringed on your copyright and they say no the first time, don't take that as like verbatim. Tell them again, no, that's my image. Here's when I posted it first. Here's where I took it. Okay? Um, this person, you know, reposted it at this time. My favorite with Instagram is they often tag him, which is how we find out. They think credit is enough, and credit is not enough. Okay? Be aware of default work for hire copyright laws. If you're doing work for other people and you want to retain copyright, be aware of the contracts and what it says about who owns what. If you are someone who has subcontractors and you want to put work for hire in your contracts as the way that the copyright is going to work, what that means is the person buying um, the content or the creative work uh, is going to own the copyright to that once it's transferred. You know, once they've been paid for it, you as the, uh, the contracting company will own that work. Um, that may be how you want to do things. I have some clients that that is the basis upon which I do the work. But be aware that will cost you more. Okay? I have a copyright transfer fee if that's what you want. Know the difference if you're a developer. Know the difference between GPL, open source, and proprietary code and software. I mean, I hope that there's no one I have to say that to here, but um, it's up there anyway. If you are developing software, this is something I'm going to say specifically to you. Check with your attorney. There's been some recent, I mean in the last three months, changes to what software can be patented. So that's specifically for the developers. Um, and, that, and, and what is covered by copyright. So that's specifically for them in relation to code. These are the three final ones, and then we'll kind of briefly chat about stock photography. Consider indemnity clauses protecting you, spelling mistake there, from copyright infringement claims arising from client-provided content. So we said that earlier, that you can be liable because your client has given you uh, content that uh, infringes copyright. So one way to protect yourself or to limit that liability is to include an indemnity or waiver clause within your contract that says, you will not be held responsible, indemnifies you against legal liability, be held responsible for the uh, copyright uh, claims of another individual. So it, it will just mean that if you get sued, you can kind of hold your contract up and say, uh-uh, 
Like, this is not on me, because my contract says that it's not on me. Um, consider client education about copyrighted material as an investment in prevention. And I realize I've used the phrase copyrighted uh, in the way that I said at the beginning not to. So it is kind of part of the language. Um, education honestly pays dividends down the long run. Uh, and, and I want, you know, you educate them and you're not going to have that issue where you have to rely on that indemnification. Okay? Understand that if you do register, uh, sorry, understand that if you want those statutory damages that I mentioned, like the big money, you do need to register with the Copyright Office. But that in order to have copyright and protection, you don't need to do anything. Okay? It is, it is just simply because you've created it. All right, let's talk about stock photography very brief, briefly. So free is often not free in the long run. Um, it's actually made me rethink and go back and maybe change some images out, especially with what I've discovered recently about Pexels and Unsplash. Um, look for Creative Commons for commercial use and then check on your attribution requ requirements if you are going to go down that route. So one thing I suggest if you do go down that route and you really sort of be like, I just don't know that I can 100% make sure, but it has a Creative Commons for commercial use license with or without attribution. What I would encourage you to do is maybe create an Excel spreadsheet that has the file name or the name of the image, the date you downloaded it, what the, what the commercial license type is, um, all of that information in one place. Because if someone comes back to you and said, actually, that's my image, you may be able to rely on that license that you believe you, you have as a, at least a partial defense. Now, I, that may well be tested in court in the next few months. Because I suspect that as the original photographers for some of these images start finding out, there will start being suits against Pexels and Unsplash. Yes? I would say to you that just because you pay for um, yes. something doesn't mean that you have commercial rights. That's yes. That's graphic stuff, which is now story blocks. If you dig into their comments, it's their as personal life. only, right? Like no commercial? No, but it's, um, you have to significantly change it from the OK, way there you go. So that the, the kind of learning lesson from that is read the licenses and know what they say you can do and what you can't do. And remember what that derivative means. So in that case, what they're saying is they're going to give you a derivative license, but they're going to require you to make substantial changes to it. Um, so watch that. Um, as I said, do your due diligence. Record where they come from. And I'm increasingly getting to the point where I think it's a good idea in your descriptions or your alt titles to include the license type on your uploaded media. Um, because I'm wondering whether or not that might actually not help if that, you know, if a copyright owner comes along and they can see you genuinely thought that that was the license type. You might find that they go, okay, we're not going to go after you, we'll go after this other person over here. Uh, but we'll see. As I said, remember credit is not enough. Um, I say this particularly for brands or people selling products. The amount of times, one of the other things that has happened, and I use my husband as an example, but you know, often he'll wear a t-shirt that he's bought or he'll have a hat on or a pair of shoes on and that brand will take the image and use it and say, well, you're wearing, well, you're wearing our stuff. Yes, but he wasn't wearing it to advertise or promote you and he didn't give you permission to infer that he's somehow endorsing your company, unless you, know, you have an ambassador contract. Um, so bear that in mind. I have much deeper articles on that stuff, if that's something you're interested in. So what actually happens if you get sued? So without statutory damages, generally speaking, most intellectual property attorneys uh, will recommend against a straight you know, a, a lawsuit, because this, the money's just not there. It's not, cost benefit is just not there. Um, and that's something to bear in mind. That's where if you've registered the images, they more, might be more likely to take it. But even if lawsuit isn't the way you're going to go, that doesn't mean that you can't do anything. So there'll often be DCMA takedown notices. Does everyone know what they are? Does anyone not know what a DCMA takedown notice is? OK, so it's the Digital Copyright Millennium Act. Digital Millennium, Millennium Copyright Act. I'm looking down here because for some reason I say it and I don't say the whole act very often. Um, it basically is what happens if you, put down, you submit a takedown notice to the uh, ISP of who hosts the website and they're the ones who have to comply with the law and take it down. 
for the cease and desist letters, that's going to go directly to the person that has infringed your copyright. Or it'll come to you if you're the one that has, um, has been alleged to have infringed copyright. Now, what I recommend with that is chat to your attorney and see if they will create a, uh, a template cease and desist letter for you, or just do it when your first situation comes up uh, with a cease and desist letter, and then you may be able to use that as a template going down the road. So you don't necessarily need to have your attorney get involved at the cease and desist letter either, a level. The final one is a licensing demand or invoice. And in fact, you might want to do these kind of, this is not really an order, you might kind of switch around depending on the situation. So a licensing demand letter is where you get a letter where they say, hey, that really should have been a commercial license. And so here's the cost for our commercial license with an added kind of fee for the fact that you used it, it was an unauthorized use. Um, they could just send you or you could just send an invoice. Hey, we noticed you used this image of ours. Here's the invoice. Here's the thing, even if they take the image down at that point, doesn't mean the copyright infringement hasn't happened. That invoice, and I've seen this happen multiple times, <coughs> if the invoice, depending on the level of where your small claims court sits, if it's under or over 5,000 or wherever it sits, you may be able to enforce that payment of that invoice in small claims court. Um, so sometimes you don't necessarily have to get, you know, the big guns and pay big money to a lawyer to get all this stuff done. You can do it a lot of it yourself. But what happens if you're accused of copyright infringement? All right, in, in responding to in, uh, claims, there's a few defenses. You actually independently created it. That can happen. Sometimes you get images or graphics that look remarkably similar, or even text that looks remarkably similar, and you really didn't. It was independently created. Sometimes that will involve some proof, um, but sometimes it might be that you have a draft of it, or you have images in the same um, session that you can show to show that you independently created it. That it was innocent, that's very, very rare, I have to tell you. Extremely rare. So unless it genuinely is innocent, don't go that direction. You know, innocent might be like your six-year-old, it's probably not gonna be you. Why I have status instead of statute of limitations, but there you go, statute of limitations. There's actually a three-year statute of limitations on infringement of copyright. So the infringement happened three years ago. Now what I will tell you is, you might have put it up on your website three years ago, but if it's still there, the infringement is today. Okay? Um, fair use, which I mentioned earlier, is, is, is a, a defense. Uh, you previously obtained a license. So this is the example where you tried to do the right thing with Unsplash and Pexels. You think you have a license, um, but maybe it may or may not be uh, a legitimate license, but that could be a defense. It could be that you obtained a license from the, co from the copyright owner and they forgot. Okay, that happens. Uh, they abandoned it. Now, I would argue that in some cases, some of the memes that are around have been abandoned. Um, there are times when something is so famous that the likelihood of someone coming after you is pretty low. But that doesn't mean it's not copyright infringement. You get what I'm saying? So this is where the cost-benefit analysis comes in. I'm certainly not encouraging you to break the law. Please don't tell anyone I said that, because I'm not. The final one is misuse. Yes? No, no, no. Statute of limitations is based on the copyright owner suing you. That has nothing to do with abandonment. Yes? So, um, from the time that the copyright infringement was committed, now, usually speaking, this is going to be an offline thing, because if something is still online, then the infringement happened today. Okay. So, if I um, printed a, a, made a printed document um, today, like say, for instance, I created something like this today, the co and, and I copied someone else's work, they would have three years to file a lawsuit or send me a demand letter for this. Uh, online, as I said, if it's still up, then copyright infringement's still happening. Misuse by the owner. Now, um, that, that's a fairly limited situation and we'd probably need to talk facts. 
I will give you a very specific example. I'm going to throw these resources up, but I will tell you that these are all on the handout. All of these links are in the handout. Um, <coughs> Getty Images found themselves into trouble. Has anyone here got a Getty Images demand letter? Yeah, a couple of people. So I'm not going to say too much about that. I have opinions, but I'm also being recorded. Um, <laughs> What I will say is this, there, was, there is a fairly well-known photographer who donated quite a few of her images to the National Archives. She did it so the images went into public domain. So people were using them, they were crediting her for them, but they were in public domain. Somebody, had no idea who, um, this is subject of lit that this has uh, been the subject of completed litigation. A, a person representing Getty, um, believed that they were doing the right thing, but they took some of those uh, public domain images and made them available for licensing and sale uh, without the permission actually of the National Archives or the photographer. Uh, they then proceeded to send demand letters to people who'd used those images and said, you owe us licensing fees. They also sent a letter to the photographer who was using her own image, which was actually part of the deal with the archives, and, and basically threatened to sue her. We're gonna charge her millions of dollars. She turned around and sued them, and she won millions and millions of dollars. That was only in the last few months. So what I'm also going to say to you is sometimes you will get a demand letter, and you won't have done anything wrong. <laughs> like, you may not have actually infringed copyright. So look at it. Don't be terrified or scared when that happens, because I, if you genuinely can't be around the blogging world long. I've, I've had people send me demand letters that aren't right. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really important. And I've also had situations where I've, I've written on university websites so, and they've been in the course of criticism and we've had to explain to the copyright owner, look, this is in the course of criticism. And they were genuinely, they were book, review, book reviews. You can't get much more critical um, than that. And we actually had to do some education for the copyright owner on, on how we were using it and the exception that applied or exemption that applied. Um, so just be aware that learning this stuff for yourself can, can help. It doesn't mean just because you get a letter that it's, that it's kosher, okay? All right, this is pretty much the slide. If you were here yesterday, I, I had then, like interest rates and insurance premiums, sometimes the cost of consulting an attorney is the cost of doing business. So that's my final slide. I have a couple of minutes for questions, but I'll be hanging around afterwards. Yes? Okay, so sharing YouTube videos on your site. Um, this is actually really interesting. If you embed the video directly from YouTube, you're probably good, okay. okay? If you download the video and then upload it on your site, not good. Like plain and simple, not good. That's copyright infringement because you're making a copy of it. But if you're embedding it, and because really, if you're embedding it, then that is, link, that is the original upload that you're embedding into your site. If you don't know what embedding is, go to the happiness bar and ask. Sheila will help. Uh, anybody else? Uh, like stock photos on eBay, people sell them like large bulk. Uh, stock photos on eBay, do you mean like a hard copy photo? No, I mean like a, like a family photo from the 1940s. Oh, so it's a really old photo. It's a photo album. Now, okay. When you buy those, do you uh, retain your rights to those or do you have to have them? Okay, you said 1940s? Okay, so remember what we said about copyright owner plus 70 years? Right. Um, what I have seen is this, someone might buy those. That doesn't mean you own the copyright to the image. You, might, you own a print of the image is what you own when you buy them. But you could do a couple of things to potentially see if you could use them. See if you can track down the photography shop. Some of them do still exist and you may be able to get a license to use that image. Like well, yes, but, the, but if they're from the 1940s, they'll generally have the studio in the back of them. Okay, because images from that day, the studios would print on the back or on the front of them. Well, they're like glass images. Like if you yeah, yeah, yeah. Images, but often the studio's name will be on them. Right. Yes. But if you own the glass image, what I heard now. Yeah, no, you own the glass image, you own the glass image. That doesn't necessarily mean you own the rights to reproduce it. Now, if it's old enough, if it's in public domain, and you have that glass, then it is likely that you will have the, the, the copyright to it. Like you, sorry, you won't have the copyright to it, but you will have the right to reproduce it because it's in the public domain. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Okay. Is there any time that putting a link on your website infringes a copyright? 
putting a link on a website infringes copyright. Honestly, I'd probably need to sit down and do a little bit of thinking about whether there was a situation where that could be infringement. My general sense is just a link, like you're directing to somewhere else? Probably not. However, I'd need to think about it. I, there could be a situation where that is the case. Actually, let me say something quickly about hashtags, because I know he talked about that. This is really um, interesting, and I actually just, I wrote an article a couple of months ago about it. So hashtags, somebody asked me, can a hashtag uh, be trademarked? Hey, it is a good question if you're using them all the time. The answer to that question seems to be from the Copyright Office that a hashtag can only be trademarked if it is so specific that it relates to one source of goods or services. So there might be a very, very specific situation where it can be trademarked, but in general, uh, it's unlikely that a hash hashtag will be trademarked. Some companies have attempted it, and they've lo they have not been able to trademark. Well, if you, if you have a trademark for the business name already and, the, and that business name in a hashtag is not kind of generic, you might be able to trademark it. But it, it has to be a very specific situation. Um, the, yeah, there's a lot of other things that we could say about trademarks and how it relates to businesses. Oh, one thing I will tell you, if you have on your Instagram, use this hashtag and I will use your image. It does not mean that you have permission. Using a hashtag in that description does not give you permission to use someone's images. I think we actually have to be done. So if you need to leave, go right ahead. But yes. What about music? That's included in all of this. Yeah, so when I gave the original definition, copyright in relation to music is, is just the same as, um, as content. I mean, it is content, but it's just the same as written word and, and photographs. Yeah, you have to be very careful using music. You have to get a license to use it on your websites. Thank you so much. I know these sessions are a huge amount of information. All right. Um, I have a stack of business cards and I have a few of my, uh, a few of the stickers up here, but thank you.